muscles of facial expression are attached to the dermis of the skin on one side and the bone bones of the face on the other side thereby when they contract they can move the skin of the face and change the appearance of the face so the people can express their feelings emotions and communicate to others changing the appearance of the face there are several muscles of facial expression we will take a look at some of them now frontalis orbicularis oculi buccinator orbicularis oris platysma the other muscles are also equally important but we will not go into details of those muscles in this lecture the complete name of frontalis muscle is occipito frontalis it has two muscle bellies frontalis in front and occipitalis behind so you have one muscle belly like this another muscle belly like that and the two muscle bellies are connected to each other by a flat tendon flat tendons are called aponeurosis in anatomy so the two muscle bellies are connected by an aponeurosis in between together it is called occipito frontalis this muscle can be used to wrinkle the forehead if the muscle on one side is paralyzed that side the wrinkling of the forehead will not be there so if this is right side and if this is left side if the right side of the uh, the frontalis muscle is paralyzed there will be no wrinkling on the forehead on the right side but there will be wrinkling on the left side of the forehead um, if you ask the person to wrinkle the forehead orbicularis oculi now this is located in front of the orbit it has two parts orbital part and the palpebral part the palpebral part is useful for soft closure of the eye as in normal blinking both parts together when they act they are important in forcefully or tightly closing the eye if this muscle is paralyzed the person will not be able to close the eye orbicularis oris this is very similar in arrangement to the orbicularis oculi it has a circumferential arrangement of muscle fibers like the previous muscle but it is located around the opening of the mouth when this muscle contracts it can tightly close the opening of the mouth as you can see in this person and this can be used to uh, puff the mouth with air and if the muscle is paralyzed on one side or both sides the air will leak out from the oral cavity when the person is trying to puff the mouth in addition when you are doing clinical examination you can ask the person to puff the mouth and you can uh, actually push the cheek on one side uh, and test the strength of the orbicularis oris muscle if the muscle is weak air will leak out from the oral cavity next muscle is buccinator muscle it is located in the area of the cheek and this muscle the one of the functions of this muscle is to uh, squeeze out the food particles that are getting collected in the vestibule of the mouth vestibule of the mouth is the area between the cheek the mucosa of the cheek on one side and the gum and the teeth on the other side uh, when there is a patient Uh, with buccinator paralysis they will complain that when they chew food food particles get uh, trapped in the vestibular uh, area next muscle is platysma muscle this muscle is attached on one side to the uh, the mandible and the other side is attached to the skin of the neck and the upper part of the chest we can move the skin of the 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 neck and the upper part of the chest by contracting this muscle like in this case you can see the contracted muscles muscle fibers bulging out under the skin of the neck the nerve that supplies all muscles of facial expression is the facial nerve 
facial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve. As you know, there are 12 cranial nerves. Two of them, they take origin from the, the brain substance, cerebrum itself. And 10 of them take origin from the brain stem area, this area. Seventh facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve, facial nerve is this one. Taking origin from the brain stem area. Facial nerve, once it leaves the brain stem, it has a short course inside the cranial cavity. Then it enters the internal acoustic meatus. Then it passes through the walls of the ear and comes out through the stylomastoid foramen. A foramen lying between the mastoid process and the styloid process. Once it emerges through the stylomastoid foramen, it enters the parotid gland. Before it enters the parotid gland, it gives three branches. And while inside the parotid gland, it gives another five branches. So three branches given before it enters the parotid gland are these. One for the occipital, belly of occipital frontalis muscle. And one to the posterior belly of digastric. You can't see that muscle here. Then the third one is to the stylo hyoid muscle. So these are the three branches given before it enters the parotid gland. Once it enters the parotid gland, it gives another five branches inside the parotid gland. And these branches exit the parotid gland at its anterior border. And these five branches are the ones that supply the muscles of facial expression. An easy way to remember the five branches of the facial nerve given inside the parotid gland is to keep the five fingers of your hand on the face. You can do it on another person or on your, on your own face. When you do that, you put the thumb on the forehead, index finger just below the eye, the middle finger over the mouth, the, the, the ring finger over the, the margin of the mandible and the, the little finger uh, towards the neck. And each of the fingers will represent one branch of the facial nerve. So the first branch is the temporal branch, second one the psychomatic branch, third one buccal, fourth one marginal mandibular or mandibular and the fifth one cervical. Before we go into details of the rest of the lecture, you should get a rough idea about uh, how the cranial nerves are arranged in the body and how the body is represented by the brain. Now the usual arrangement is the brain represents the body in a contralateral manner. That means the right side of the brain represents the left side of the body and the left side of the brain represents the right side of the body. And to do that, the fibers from one side has to cross to the opposite side. So this is common for all arrangements of the nervous system in the body. Cranial nerves have got two types of nerve fibers involved in their pathway. One is called the upper motor neuron. It comes and stops in the brain stem. Then in the brain stem, a second neuron starts which is called the lower motor neuron. When it comes to cranial nerves, including the facial nerve, the actual nerve that you see outside, it actually contains the lower motor neuron fibers. And the neuron cell bodies of these fibers, they are collected together in one place in the brain stem. And this collection is called the nucleus of that uh, cranial nerve. So you call it cranial nerve nucleus. So facial nerve also has got a cranial nerve nucleus. And most of the cranial nerves has got supply from both sides of the cerebral hemispheres, left side and right side. So they got a bilateral supply. But when it comes to the facial nerve, uh, the, the, the facial nucleus that supplies the, uh, the muscles of facial expression, it has uh, some peculiar arrangement. The nucleus has an upper part and a lower part. Upper part and a lower part upper part supplies the upper part of the face upper part of the face and the lower part of the nucleus supplies the lower part of the face 
it is the upper part of the nucleus that supplies the upper part of the face gets the bilateral supply but when it comes to the lower part of the nucleus that supplies the lower part of the face it has got only a unilateral supply from the opposite side of the brain so it's actually contralateral representation so to summarize it it is like this the muscles of facial expression in the upper part of the face they are supplied by the upper part of the facial nucleus bilaterally from the two cerebral hemispheres lower part of the face facial muscles they are supplied by the lower half of the facial nucleus which gets its supply from the opposite side cerebrum which is contralateral if there is damage to the upper motor neurons as shown in this case here since the upper part of the face is supplied by left side as well as right side the upper part of the face will not get affected the muscles will function as normal but the lower part of the face which gets only supply from the opposite side will be gone and therefore the lower half of the face muscles will be paralyzed like in this case shown in the image this upper and lower parts of the face is actually divided at the level of the eye including the eye when you say upper part it's the forehead area and the eye the lower part is the part below that we can see that when we look at uh, clinical cases on the other hand if the damage is to the lower motor neuron which is you know actually the cranial nerve if you damage the facial nerve directly which includes lower motor neuron fibers both the upper part of the face and the lower part of the face the muscles will be paralyzed because whether the supply comes from the same side or from the opposite side uh, they all will have to go through the lower motor neuron to supply the face and all these fibers will be uh, affected and you, the whole side of the face will be Uh, paralyzed so this is called lower motor type of facial palsy and the previous one is called upper motor type of facial palsy this is another example to show upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron facial palsies now in this case there is upper motor neuron lesion involving the upper motor neurons of the left facial nerve upper motor neurons of the left facial nerve are damaged since the uh, the upper motor neurons coming from the same side even though the opposite side is damaged upper motor neurons coming from the same side also supplies the face on the left side upper half of the face is not affected but since the lower half the fibers supplying the lower half of the face they come only from the opposite side when those fibers are damaged lower half of the face will be paralyzed in the second example as you can see here if the lower motor neuron is damaged whether it comes from the left side or right side both since the both supplies will be gone and therefore the whole side of the face upper and lower are gone these are two examples of facial nerve palsy in both cases the paralysis is on the right side in the first image you can see the patient has been asked to close the eyes but you can see his right eye is not closing properly and you can also see that his mouth is deviated to the left side and on the right side the angle of the mouth is drooping and the nasolabial fold is almost absent on this side which is present on this side if you ask the patient to wrinkle the forehead this side the forehead will wrinkle and this side the forehead will not wrinkle so by looking at this person and asking him to do certain things you can clearly say that this is a right lower motor neuron facial palsy on the other hand in this lady if you look at her you can see that when she is asked to close the eyes both eyes are properly closed but if you look at the 
uh, the mouth, you can see that the mouth is still deviated to the left side. You can see slight drooping of the right corner of the mouth. The slight, you know, uh, disturbance on the nasolabial fold, not like in the previous case. If you ask this patient to wrinkle the forehead, you will see wrinkling on both sides, not like in the previous case. So basically, in this case, upper half of the face is not affected, but lower half of the face is affected. So this is actually a right upper motor neuron type of facial palsy. This is how you differentiate between upper motor neuron facial palsy and lower motor neuron facial palsy in a patient. Please follow the links to subscribe to the channel, like the channel and activate notifications. And if you find it difficult to understand cranial nerves, please follow the links to move to the next lecture.